Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor Payne, Professor Hay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm honored and delighted to have been asked to give this year's annual Sperry Lecture. This particular acronym, um, I know, stands for Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute, and I want this lecture to illustrate some of the power and value of a political economy approach to the most urgent issue in contemporary British macroeconomic policy, namely the past and future of George Osborne's austerity program. Uh, it was mentioned just now that um, I wrote a book in 2009 called um, Keynes, The Return of the Master, and um, one uh, rather acid uh, comment on it was, well, the master returned for a year, and after that he was put back in the cupboard. Um, so um, there has been, uh, the, the narrative since then has not been a Keynesian one. I'm currently writing a book called um, Unsettled Questions in Macroeconomic Policy, and the historically minded among you will know that the inspiration of this title comes from John Stuart Mill's famous essay of 1844 called Some Unsettled Issues in Political Economy. Mill was puzzled to know how Say's Law, crudely the doctrine that supply, cr supply creates its own demand, could be reconciled with um, frequent um, cycles of boom and bust and uh, long periods of depression during which goods were left unsold as people withdrew from spending. And Mill came up with an ingenious answer. Provided when people started hoarding money, workers were employed producing money, there would never be any lasting unemployment. Mill's essay exhibits two recurring features of economic argument. First, coming at the tail end of a major agricultural and industrial depression, it fits the pattern of questioning existing economic theory when it cannot answer questions uppermost in people's minds. And the same happened during the Great Depression of 1929-32, uh, which gave rise to Keynesian uh, uh, theory, and in the stagflationary uh, decade of the 1970s, which produced monetarism. And the same questioning, um, this time, of efficient market theory is taking place today in the wake of our own, very, our very own Great Recession. But Mill's essay also exhibits another recurring feature of economic theorizing, what you might call a Lakatosian strategy of protecting the central doctrine by modifying it sufficiently to achieve a modicum of consistency with the facts. Perhaps this is what every science does. Thus, Mill concludes his attack on Say's law with a qualified defense of Say's law. To wit, every increase of production, if distributed without miscalculation, among all kinds of produce in the right proportions would it creates or rather constitutes its own demand. Notice he has slipped in the requirement of correct calculation and perfect competition to validate Say's law. So theoretical coherence is saved at the expense of realism. In my forthcoming book, I treat fiscal theory as one of the most important unsettled issues of today. It goes without saying that it was far from settled by this election result. In fact, one of the terrifying things about the election was the appallingly low level of public debate about economic matters. There was not a glimpse of economic theory in any discussion, even in the so-called quality press, and facts were simply plucked from the most convenient shelf uh, of data to hand. The Conservatives accused the previous Labour government of having overspent, as though the existence of a deficit in 2010 was self-evident proof of malfeasance. Labour, far from defending its record or justifying the possible value of running a deficit in difficult circumstances, 
has ended up promising only to cut the deficit more fairly, perhaps a tiny bit slower than the Conservatives. Perhaps public debates were always like this. Walter Badgett wrote about one 19th century politician that, I quote, the secret of his success was that he always left out the premises on which his arguments depended. <laughs> but, at this but, at the but at that time, this was considered sufficiently unusual um, to, to be worthy of comment. To realize it was not the general rule in the 19th century, we need only to turn to the incredibly high intellectual level of the debates between Asquith and Joseph Chamberlain on the issue of free trade versus protection in 19, 1902 to 1903, before vast audiences, considerably less well-educated than today's voters are supposed to be. There was nothing remotely like this in the recent election, nor indeed in the build-up to it. None of the leaders were up to it, intellectually or rhetorically. Yet the issues, the future of our union, the future of the European Union, the future of our economy, are hardly less momentous. But now down to business. The main unsettled issue in fiscal policy concerns the relationship between the government's budget and the economy. This is part of a wider debate, of course, about the role of the state in economic life, but I leave to one side that wider issue and concentrate on the economic argument while recognizing that it leaves a good deal out of account. On the economic question, two positions can be identified. The first views straight fru state frugality or parsimon parsimony as a necessary condition of the growth of wealth. The second argues that state spending can play a positive role in creating wealth. Which is correct and under what conditions? Let's consider each of them in a historical context. By the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the settled view among the leading British economies, economists was that a large state budget retarded the growth of wealth. State spending, it was said, was inherently unproductive and therefore took resources from the productive economy. Taxation to pay for it ought to be kept as low as possible as a share of national income. This was the foundation stone of scientific fiscal policy and it is the missing premise of George Osborne's austerity program. The founding father of the doctrine of state frugality was less Adam Smith than David Ricardo. The theory of Ricardian equivalence is of particular relevance to the current debate. Borrowing, according to this argument, is simply deferred taxation. Taxation is better than borrowing, undesirable though large taxation is, is better than borrowing because it reveals to taxpayers the full extent of their liabilities. Borrowing, on the other hand, may delude them into thinking that they only have to pay interest on the national debt, this is Ricardo's argument, and therefore blind them to the need to save enough to pay the full cost of government extravagance. What we, we shall see a little later is how the theory of rational expectations by removing the element of delusion which Ricardo took for granted, removed the possibility that borrowing could have any beneficial effect. The doctrine of state frugality underpinned the Victorian fiscal constitution. Its rules were simple. Governments were to be kept small in relation to the economy. No investment function for the state was allowed, despite Adam Smith, who argued that the state did have some duties, notably the um, erection and maintenance of public uh, institutions, um, and, 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 and also promoting education, something the Victorians neglected to um, the great, um, the great, uh, um, um, uh, the great, um, you know, and that contributed to the failure of the British economy in the 19th century. The budget was to be annually balanced, 
balancing the budget included a surplus for repaying the national debt. That was included in the definition of a balanced budget. Maintaining an annual sinking fund was considered important for maintaining confidence in the government's credit worthiness. Borrowing was for war only, and free trade policy made war less likely. The implicit premise behind all this was that markets were optimally self-adjusting, or to put it another way, that the market economy always tended to full employment. This idea seemed to be contradicted by the business cycle. But it's important to notice that there was just enough accidental correspondence between the theory and the facts in the 50 years leading up to the First World War um, to obviate a frontal assault on the theory. Keynes expressed this historical conjuncture, albeit somewhat long-windedly, in a, in a language that Victorian economists would have found somewhat strange, and I'm quoting um, this passage from the general theory. He wasn't always the most brilliant stylist. He was very often, but this isn't a particular um, example of it. During the 19th century, he writes, the growth of population and of invention, the opening up of new lands, the state of confidence, and the frequency of war seem to have been sufficient taken in conjunction with the propensity to consume, to establish a schedule of the marginal efficiency of capital, which allowed a reasonably satisfactory average level of employment to be compatible with a rate of interest high enough to be psychologically acceptable to wealth holders. Uh, unravel that. And you've got Keynesian theory in a nutshell. Um, but what, what he's be basically saying is that in that era, the capitalist market system worked more or less as it was expected to, but not for the reasons it was expected to. <clears throat> now, this settled theory underlying Victorian fiscal practice was overturned in the 20th century by the experience of prolonged mass unemployment, which led to the Keynesian revolution. Keynes and his followers denied that state spending was necessarily at the expense of private spending. Rather, they took private investment to be inherently volatile and thus saw a permanent investment role for the state to stabilize the macroeconomy. In slump conditions, Keynesians argued, discretionary changes in public spending should be used to offset the fall in private spending. And the logic of that pointed to borrowing rather than taxation, since its purpose was to make a net impact on total spending. Now, I'm abstracting here from the theory of the balanced budget multiplier. Um, it was the Great Depression of 1929 to 32 which demolished the century-old edifice of Victorian public finance. And a key element in that demolition was the confrontation between Keynes and Sir Richard Hopkins of the Treasury at the Macmillan Committee on the 6th of May, 1930. Now, its background is as follows, in the run-up to the general election of 1929, Lloyd George had issued a pledge which Keynes endorsed um, that a liberal government, the Conservatives then being in power, would borrow 250 million for a two-year program of infrastructure development to get rid of what he called abnormal unemployment. The Treasury had rubbished his proposals by restating the Ricardian doctrine Loan finance capital spending would leave a hole in private capital. Ralph Hawtrey, the intellectual architect of the Treasury view, stated one part of this doctrine with Ricardian clarity in as early as 1909. Well, it wasn't as early. It was after a century of practice. And I quote, the government, by the very act of borrowing, for state expenditure is withdrawing from the investment market, saving which would otherwise be applied to the creation of capital. By 1923, Hawtrey had abandoned the full employment assumption and conceded that government spending could 
government borrowing could increase um, employment, but only if it was financed by the Bank of England, i.e. only by expanding the money supply. In quantity theory of money terms, he concluded that it was the monetary expansion, not the government spending on public works, which caused, would, would cause increased employment, and the same result could be achieved without any government spending, simply by printing money, which is a doctrine, of course, of quantitative easing, essentially. You don't need the government to be doing nasty government to be doing any, any of this, just print money and the private sector would spring to life because interest rates would be forced down. <clears throat> In his testimony to the Macmillan Committee on the 6th of May, Sir Richard Hopkins receded from these heights of Ricardian abstraction to the lower slopes of practical considerations, which is what you'd expect a good civil servant to do, wouldn't you? No, the Treasury wasn't opposed to government spending as such, Sir Richard Hopkins said, but only to the particular plans put forward by Lloyd George. These plans, far from setting up a cycle of prosperity, as Keynes had hoped, would much more probably produce a great cry against waste. So the loans would have to be, I quote, put out at a very high price. This new version of the Treasury Doctrine, later labeled <coughs> psychological, psychological crowding out, took Keynes by surprise. <coughs> he tried to pin Hopkins down to his own original understanding of the Treasury view. Was it the Treasury position, Keynes asked, that schemes of capital development are of no use for reducing unemployment? That was going much too far, Hopkins said. Did the Treasury not believe that any capital that could be found for their schemes would be diverted from other uses? That, said Hopkins, was a too rigid expression of the Treasury view. It was the atmosphere in which schemes may be undertaken which conditions their effects. You mean, said Keynes, that if the schemes are very unpopular, they may have reactions of an adverse kind? Yes. But, what would, but that would not affect the amount of employment the scheme would create. Not the amount of that particular scheme but it immediately alters its dynamic properties. This is Hopkins replying. So the issue, Keynes went on, between those who are in favor of these schemes and those who are against them is not whether they cure unemployment. Do you wish me to agree, Hopkins asked. What's the point where we differ, um, Keynes said. And Hopkins replied, if a scheme of this type is undertaken under different conditions from those which you assume, it is not in itself a dynamic force towards a great renewal of activity and prosperity. It does then make a hole in the capital which is available for the purposes of the community. It might lead people to believe that this country was not a good place to do business in. Is it your view that all the capital which is available is used? Well, and so it goes on. Yes, the Treasury view is not a rigid dogma. It is the result of the view that we take as to the practical reactions to the scheme. It bends so much that I find difficulty in getting hold of it, Keynes said. Yes, I do not think these views are capable of being put in the rigid form of a theoretical doctrine. Now, let's stand back for a moment. What Hopkins had done was to invoke what Paul Krugman in 2011 called the confidence fairy, the confidence fairy. The view that the effects of a budget deficit on the economy depend on the expectations of the business, of a business community, right or wrong, about its effects. Formally, that it depends on the model of the economy in the minds of the business community. If they believe that a government loan finance program of capital investment would make things worse, that belief would cancel any possible beneficial effects of that program by causing a spike in interest rates. Or, as Hock Hopkins himself put it in 1931, things don't, these arguments don't change much over the years, which is why I call them perennially unsettled. 
as Hopkins put it in 1931, if you had to get the loan taken up at a very high rate of interest, you would very quickly lose what you gained. It was loss of confidence in government finance which would create the hole in private capital. It would have been fascinating had Keynes continued his cross-examination of Hopkins by asking the Treasury Knight whether it was the Treasury's view that a program of reducing the deficit would improve confidence sufficiently to bring about an economic recovery. Because this obverse of the Lloyd George plan was exactly what the Labour government was driven to in the crisis, financial crisis of 1931. That government, the Labour government, elected in 1929, had implemented a small part of the Lloyd George program. Far too small to make much impression on unemployment, but enough to alarm the city. The deepening depression, unemployment rising from 10.4% to 20% uh, in, in 1939, left Philip Snowden, Chancellor of the Exchequer, with a projected deficit of 5% of GDP. The political debate now took on an uncannily familiar uh, note. The conservative opposition blamed the deficit on the extravagance of the Labour government and demanded cuts in wasteful public spending, especially on unemployment benefits. Labour said the hole in the budget was due to the slump. The minority Labour government refused to implement the full scale of the spending cuts demanded by the bond markets, in this case JP Morgan, the government's American broker. As a consequence, the Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, and his Chancellor joined the Conservatives and Liberals in a national government in August 1931, while Labour went into opposition. Faced with a prospective deficit of 170 uh, million, uh, we talked in millions then, not billions, the national government proposed to balance the budget by a combination of raising taxes and cutting um, spending. And with its allocation of 20 million for debt repayment, this was the last hurrah of the Victorian balanced budget rule. Then there was a recovery, and, but it wasn't really till the huge uh, loan financed rearmament program of 1937 to 38 that Britain finally escaped the semi slump ten years after the Great Depression. A new note had been struck by John Maynard Keynes. Look after unemployment, he said, and the budget will look after itself. Something that would be impossible to say now in, 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 in politics anyway. There's no doubt that Keynes was shaken by Hopkins's confidence fairy. Experience of slump was not itself sufficient to loosen the hold of old theory. That could only be done by a counter theory. Keynes's general theory of 1936 may be seen as his attempt to create a different set of expectations concerning the effects of budgetary policy on the economy. As he wrote on page 162 of that book, Economic prosperity is excessively dependent on a political and social atmosphere which is uh, congenial to the average businessman. Today I think he might have written the average bondholder, for with the financialization of the economy, it is the bondholder, not the businessman, whose expectations define the scope of government policies. So we come to the Keynesian fiscal constitution of the 1950s and 60s, which was comprised of two elements alien to the Victorians, a budget balanced at a much higher level of taxes and spending than the Victorians would have accepted, and a budget deliberately unbalanced with a corollary of a temporary rise in the national debt whenever um, the economy moved into a slump. 
The object of this constitution was to create a settled expectation in the minds of the business community that by its spending, whether on investment or consumption, the state would not allow a slump to develop again. This was expected to create the confidence needed for long-term investment. That was the essence of the Keynesian fiscal constitution. Well, we all know that how it was undermined by the stagflation of the 1970s. Keynesian tools seemed powerless to prevent the simultaneous appearance of unemployment and inflation, which, of course, in the opinion of those hostile to the Keynesian system, um, were attributed to Keynesian policy itself. With its well-known propensity to mistake a correlation for a cause, the economics profession started to argue that it was the inflation that was causing the unemployment and that the conquest of inflation was the necessary and possibly the sufficient condition for the restoration of full employment. This took it back straight into Ricardian territory. The new classical economics reinstated Ricardian equivalence. In the United Kingdom, Nigel Lawson reestablished the Victorian fiscal constitution in the 1980s. And with variations, national variations, it wasn't equally accepted everywhere, the new wisdom took hold globally. Inflation was to be fought by monetary policy. Governments would not use the budget to balance the economy at full employment, but instead would seek to balance the budget over the cycle. Now, that was a modification from the old Victorian uh, doctrine of the balanced budget to allow for the influence of the so-called automatic stabilizers. In other words, at long last, um, sort of uh, fiscal policy um, um, uh, had, had, had moved on from Victorian times and accepted the possibility of a business cycle. Governments renounced responsibility um, for maintaining a stable level of investment because they privatized most of the commercial economy. Deliberate deficit financing to meet a crisis was abjured because if prices were kept stable, the economy was presumed to be naturally, cyclically stable at its natural rate of unemployment. Now, that was basically the wisdom with which we blundered in to the last recession. And three issues arise. To what extent does the success of a policy depend on expectations? What causes expectations to be what they are? And what light do the data on the effects of different kinds of policies shed on the first of these questions? In 2011, Nobel laureate economist Paul Krugman characterized conservative discourse on budget deficits in terms of bond vigilantes and the confidence fairy. I've referred to the second already. Unless governments cut their deficits, the bond vigilantes will scupper them by forcing up interest rates. But if they do cut their deficits, the confidence fairy will reward them by stimulating private spending more than the cuts depress it. Con that's how he characterized conservative discourse in the, in, the, in the first years of the recession. Krugman thought that the bond vigilante claim might be valid for a few countries such as Greece, but argued the confidence fairy was a figment of the conservative imagination. Cutting a deficit in a slump would never cause a recovery, he said. Political rhetoric can stop a good policy from being adopted, but it cannot stop it from succeeding. And this was exactly Keynes's position before the Macmillan Committee in 1931. Conversely, um, it cannot make, uh, expectations cannot make a bad policy work, whatever the expectations um, uh, my, whatever the expectations created by its adoption. In short, Keynesians like myself predicted that Osborne's Ricardian austerity policy would fail to revive the British economy, even though it was thought to be right by business and financial circles. <coughs> but, but, like Keynes, I was shaken by the confidence argument and put the point to Krugman um, at a New York uh, event. <coughs> 
Was it not possible, I asked Krugman, that adverse expectations could affect a policy's results, not just the chance that it will be adopted? <clears throat> For example, if people thought that government borrowing was simply deferred taxation, might they not save more out of their incomes to meet their expected future tax bill? Conversely, <clears throat> would not a credible deficit reduction policy lead them to expect lower taxes, which would be good for policy? I was putting this counter-argument. Krugman didn't buy this. A market was a market. If governments spent enough to cause the market to grow, businessmen would invest more to provide more goods. That's what he argued. Expectations followed. They did not lead results. They followed results. I don't think we reached perfect agreement on this, but the debate did raise the question of where expectations come from. The rational expectations theory holds that they are model determined. Individuals can perceive through a learning process the correct model of the economy. Rational expectations are then said to be informed predictions of future events and as such are the same as the predictions of the relevant economic theory. The relevant economic theory for the new classical economics was, of course, new classical theory, not Keynesian theory. And that has its roots in Ricardo and its successors, as, 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 as I've pointed out. The essential assumption underlying new classical economics is that markets continuously clear. It can be put like this. There are four sources of demand in an economy. Consumption demand, investment demand, foreign demand, and government demand. Neoclassical economics, new classical economics tells us that with properly functioning markets, there can be no shortage of the first three, and therefore no need for the fourth. Say's law holds. Government spending should therefore be minimized since it reduces efficiency of supply. But this requires the assumption of almost unlimited price and wage flexibility. By contrast, the incorrect Keynesian models rely on wage and price rigidities not fully accounted for by its underlying theory. So what the new classical economists said, we, ha we have a theory to explain why markets should clear, but Keynes does not have a theory to explain why they should fail to clear. And that was the intellectual foundation on which current fiscal policy is built. You might argue that such a chain of reasoning never occurs to your average businessman, and I would agree. But I mean, let me remind you of Keynes's remark about practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from intellectual influences being the slaves of some defunct economist. Uh, and the actual rhetoric of Cameron's first government uh, pinpoint, pinpoints the similarity of pinpointing the similarity of the household and the government budget, the overspending and extravagance of the previous Labour government, the danger of a bond market strike going the way of Greece, and the burden of the national debt is simply the banal echo of a barely understood but hugely resonant view of the relationship between the state budget and the economy, which survived the Keynesian revolution and has come back to haunt us uh, uh, in the present day. But ultimately, we have to ask, does new classical macroeconomics provide the correct model of the economy? In particular, does it correctly specify the relationship between the government's budget and the economy? Here, the data can help us, <coughs> though they do not conclusively settle the question. The austerity policy relies on what is thought to be a reliable prediction encapsulated in the phrase expansionary fiscal contraction. The idea that the less the government spends, the faster the economy will grow. A massive research effort went into proving this and its converse uh, uh, by the economists of the so-called Bocconi School. <clears throat> 
In the, the 1980s and 1990s, a number of influential papers were published which claimed to have established a positive correlation between increases in government spending, increases in government spending, and a slowdown in the rate of growth. And the reason was straight from Ricardo. Government spending was less productive than private sector spending. And the converse of this was that a reduction in the size of the budget would increase the growth rate. Both were long-run arguments. But the second argument was now applied to short-run fiscal policy for depression. A decrease in public spending would speed up recovery. Hence the importance of the deficit in discussions of appropriate fiscal policy. And this short-run argument for cutting the deficit had nothing to do with the long-run efficiency of the economy, but with confidence, everything to do with confidence. Against the Keynesian proposition that expanding the deficit in a slump would increase aggregate demand, the fiscal contractionists argue that it would reduce aggregate demand by damaging confidence. Their argument was that a credible program of deficit reduction would generate the confidence to more than offset the direct effects of fiscal contraction. They arrived at some striking correlations. For example, an increase in government size by 10 percentage points is associated with a 0.5 to 1% lower annual growth rate. That was, that was the case against expanding uh, a deficit. Then, in April 2010, Harvard University's Albert Alessina, a graduate of Milan's Bocconi University, issued, assured European finance ministers, the date is important, April 2010, the date of the general election, he assured European finance ministers that, I quote, even sharp reductions of budget deficits have been accompanied and immediate, immediately followed by sustained growth rather than recession. Alessina's work influenced Jean-Claude Trichet, president of the European Central Bank and President Obama's Council of Economic Advisers, but crucially, it fed directly into the UK Treasury's emergency budget of June 2010. Well, Alessina didn't last for long, though he's still around on the lecture circuit. Other studies led to conclusions more conformable with common sense, viz that an economic expansion can occur despite a fiscal contraction if other factors are at work, like currency depreciation, export, mar export demand enlargement, and so on. We're reminded again that a correlation is not a cause. Added to this, the proponents of expansionary fiscal contraction um, twisted their logic to fit the facts. Since the cuts had to be credible, i.e. large and decisive, they could blame any failure of their predictions to materialize on the insufficiency of the credibility. Now, this is an argument that can't be refuted. Um, <clears throat> thus, on balance, the failure of Europe to recover immediately has been due to lack of confident in confidence in government's ability to deliver the promised cuts. So, Al that's Alessina. Now, so, what ev other evidence do we have? Since 2011-2012, evidence has been accumulating that fiscal, uh, that expansionary fiscal contraction is contractionary, full stop, not expansionary. Um, and there's now a wide, wide agreement on the damage it's caused. The Office of Budget Responsibility um, which is the government's own watchdog, has just concluded that austerity reduced UK GDP growth by 2% 2 from 2010 to 2012, bringing a cumulative cost of austerity since 2010 to 5% of GDP 
Simon Wren Lewis of Oxford University estimates that the damage might be as high as 15% of GDP. That's 15% an economy, 15% smaller than it would have been if more sensible fiscal policies had been adopted. And two thirds of British economists agree with this. And moreover, Britain isn't alone from having suffered from the effects of fiscal austerity. In, in, in its October 2012 World Economic Outlook, the IMF admitted that fiscal multipliers were underestimated across the world. In plain English, the forecasters underestimated the extent of spare capacity and hence the scope for fiscal expansion to raise output. Was that an honest mistake? You always ask that about statistics that turn out to be wrong. Or was it because the forecasters were enthralled to economic models that implied that economies were at full employment, in which case, of course, fiscal expansion can't have the beneficial effects claim, can only lead to inflation. What the conservatives, what the conservatives, conservatives did succeed in doing, <coughs> and doing brilliantly, was to persuade English voters, not Scottish voters, that they were only cleaning up Labour's mess and that but for austerity, Britain would have gone the way of Greece. Unfortunately, no other party, with the exception of the Scottish nationalists, was able to develop an effective counter-narrative. So the debate between austerity and expansion was never properly engaged. <coughs> And it should be, because there is a case for austerity. It could be argued that the economy is finding a new equilibrium, though at the cost of much breakage. It could be, it could, it could be said, and it's a matter of common observation, that the stock and real estate markets have been booming that labor is doing its, that the labor market is doing its job in a rough and ready way of reallocating labor to new jobs in line with the reduced circumstances in which the economy finds itself. But of course, at the, at the cost of a collapse of real wages and productivity and a reduction in potential output, but still, you know, it's not, you can't talk any longer about rigid money wages as we used, they used to in Keynes's days. The labor market is working in a sort of terribly sort of malign way. But the recovery is flaky and insecure. And the question remains, did we have to undergo this breakage in order to achieve such mediocre results? In short, was it really necessary to prolong the slump in order to get a recovery? And we've got, to, we've got to start talking about this. George Osborne is back as chancellor, promising even tougher cuts, cuts in the next five years. And fiscal austerity is still the reigning doctrine in the Eurozone, thanks to Germany. So the damage is set to continue. In the absence of a compelling counter-narrative, we may be fated to find out just how much pain the victims can stand before the peasants start to revolt. Now, I should end there, but I want to just go right in the last paragraph, go back to political economy. What I've been talking about is a particular aspect of a debate about the role of the state in the economy, which has gone on since at least the 18th century and has been settled in different ways in different countries at different times. It's a debate which has always been compounded of at least two elements. A discussion about the effects of state activities on the size and efficiency of the economy and a debate about the effect of state activities on the liberty of the subject. In both aspects, it remains one of the great unsettled issues of economic policy today. Thank you. Thank you.